and as you may recognize that, that's a major scale, the foundation of all of our melodies. Does anyone think that's really cool that essentially all of our harmony and all of how we think about harmony is embedded within the first 16 harmonics of the harmonic series? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, so it's probably not a surprise for me to tell you that because this is essentially where our harmony system of harmony comes from, this is also where our um, system of what sounds good and what sounds in tune comes from. And it turns out that the closer you get to the beginning of the harmonic series, the more, the better or more consonant intervals sound and the more in tune we consider them to be. Okay? So if we know exactly what's in tune, then why would we not tune our musical instruments to correspond with those intervals that are perfectly in tune? Well, we're gonna tune, take this theoretical piano, and I have the notes labeled on it, and we're going to tune some of the notes according to how they should be tuned with the ratios of the harmonic series. So we're going to tune the fundamental pitch, we have 220 hertz, the A, and an octave above that, the ratio of two, and the fifth and the third, according, all according to their ratios. Now, just for comparison, these are the pitches that pianos are actually tuned to. As you can see, the octave is pure. Well, in theory, it's pure. Things are actually slightly more complicated than that. But the fifth is slightly flat, and the major third is actually extremely sharp. So what kind of strange thing could be going on that would make it be necessary for us to tune our piano out of tune? Well, it turns out, as many things are, it's not actually quite as simple as you might want it to be. So we're going to start out by looking at this C sharp. As you can see, the C sharp on the piano is the same key as the G flat. So if you tune up a major third from A to a C sharp, that's tuning, uh, up, yeah, that's tuning a C sharp, not a D flat, because you're going up a third, not a diminished fourth. So if you were to tune a D flat, one way you might do it, using only ratios from the harmonic series, or intervals from the harmonic series, is you might go up an octave to the A, down a major third to the F, and down another major third to the D flat. And I'm just gonna show you that here. And so you take an octave, and you take away a major third, and remember how um, intervals are on a logarithmic scale, so we actually need to divide rather than subtract. And you get this interval of eight to five, which corresponds to the F. And now take away another major third, you get the interval of 32 to 25, which corresponds to the D flat. As you can see, that is not the same interval as the C sharp, which is the, has the interval of five to four. And the difference between them is this interval of 128 to 125, which we call a disus. And this proves that C sharp and D flat, or any other two of what we call enharmonic equivalents, or two notes with the same pitch but different names, are not actually equivalent. They don't actually necessarily have the same pitch. And so one, one possible solution to this is just to add more keys to the keyboard. You know, one for C sharp, one for D flat. But, and this was actually fairly common practice in the Baroque and classical eras. However, it didn't really catch on because it made the instrument exceedingly difficult to play, <laughs> as you might imagine. Now, it also turns out that just adding more keys doesn't solve all of the problems, because there's more problems that arise. Even notes, which only have, <laughs> even notes which only have one name sometimes have, can have more than one pitch associated with them. Take, for example, the B. The B is one major second above the A. However, there's a few ways we might go about tuning that. We might go up a perfect fifth to the E and down a perfect fourth to the B, or we might go up a major sixth to the F sharp and down a perfect fifth to the B. Those are both, those would both use um, intervals that are perfectly in tune and so could be both called in tune major seconds. However, they actually give two different intervals. One major second is the interval of nine to eight, and the other one is the interval of 10 to nine. And that you can see the difference between them is the interval of 81 to 80, which we call a syntonic comma. And this shows that even notes with the same name can't always be exactly the same pitch. 
Now there's one more example I'm going to show you, and this involves the circle of fifths. And many of you might be familiar with the circle of fifths, as it has many applications in theory, like, for example, the order of the keys. However, that's not what we're concerned with right now. The basic idea of the circle of fifths is if you start with a very low note, such as a G flat in this illustration, and you go a series of 12 perfect fifths, eventually you will come to the enharmonic of the original note, however, seven octaves higher. Now, it probably won't surprise you, because we've already said that enharmonic equivalents are not necessarily equivalent. It probably won't surprise you for me to tell you that those two will not actually be perfectly equivalent. However, it might surprise you if I tell you that the difference between them, this interval here, which we call a Pythagorean comma, which is just because you can't really tell how big it is from those large numbers, but it's slightly larger than the syntonic comma. Um, that is a different interval than the other two enharmonic equivalents we had. So, and the other interesting thing is that in the previous example, if we were using, say, a G flat and an F sharp, the one that would be higher is the G flat would be slightly higher than the F sharp. But in this example, the F sharp would actually be slightly higher than the G flat. And for some simple mathematical proofs, which we're not going to go through right now, um, you can prove that there are actually an infinite number of different distinct pitches that would be necessary if you were to play every possible interval in tune. Now, that's kind of a difficult thing to deal with when you're trying to tune a piano, which has only 12 distinct pitches per octave. So, um, but you might think, well, how much of a difference do these little discrepancies make? I mean, the interval of 81 to 80, like that's tiny, right? It just can't make a big difference. Well, I'm going to show you how big of a difference it makes. On this piano, you can change the temperament or tuning system, and I'm going to change it so that it's perfectly in tune in one key. And we're going to say the key of C major, okay? So just for comparison, this is our normal tuning system. This is it in the key of C major, perfectly in two. You can tell how nice those intervals sound. However, if you were going to use that same set of intervals and move it to a different key, like say F sharp major, it sounds a little bit different. Okay, ready? compensating for. So what, how do we tune our piano? What system do we use? We use something called, oh, I forgot that slide. Um, we use something called equal temperament. And the idea of equal temperament is you take a perfect octave of the ratio of two to one, well, theoretically you take a perfect octave, and you divide it equally into 12 semitones. And because um, intervals are on a logarithmic scale, that means you need to find a common ratio that will multiply those intervals rather than a common difference between them. And so how you do that is you take the ratio of an octave, which is two, and you take the nth root of two, where n is the number of divisions you want, so in this case, 12. So every interval in equal temperament is a multiple of the 12th root of two. And this actually has interesting connotations, because if every interval is in is a multiple of this, um, of this number. By definition, we can see that this number, because we need a radical to express it, is, will be by definition irrational. However, the one thing in common with every single ratio that can be formed using the harmonic series is that they will all be rational. And so this shows that no interval in equal temperament except, of course, the octaves, are perfectly in tune with any interval within the harmonic series. However, this doesn't just apply to equal temperament with 12, with 12 tone octave division. It also applies to any equal division of the scale. So if you were, say, to take 
an octave and divide it equally into 200 billion different tiny little notes, then not one of them would be perfectly in tune with any one of the infinitely large, any one of the intervals in the infinitely large harmonic series. That's something interesting to think about. <laughs> now, equal temperament, we've been using it for, it hasn't been around for a super long time. We've been using it for less than 200 years at this point. And although it's almost universal today, it's not the only tuning system that's ever been used. About 2,500 years ago, there lived a man. You may have heard of him. Um, his name was Pythagoras. And as well as being a famous mathematician, philosopher, and bean lover, he was also a musician. And he is accredited with being the first person to discover that the most consonant intervals can be formed by strings whose lengths are in ratio, are in simple integer ratios. And the, ra the intervals that he decided were consonant were the interval of a perfect octave with the ratio of two, the interval of a perfect fifth with the ratio of three to two, and the interval of a perfect fourth, which is the difference between an octave and a perfect fifth, with the ratio of four to three. And he devised a tuning system based on these intervals. Um, and so in his tuning system, all octaves were perfectly pure and all fifths and fourths were perfectly pure. Now, this tuning system actually was quite well suited to music for a very long time, as throughout the Middle Ages, the primary interval in music in harmony was the perfect fifth. And in fact, much, um, much of harmony was a melody with then a harmony that was in parallel fifths above that melody which is very different from how we think of music now. And so all those parallel fifths would be guaranteed to be perfectly in tune with Pythagorean tuning. So it worked quite well. And just for comparison, Pythagorean tuning was dominant for about 2,000 years, which is quite a bit longer than equal temperament has been around for. Now, Pythagorean tuning didn't last forever. Around about 1,400, 1,500, there came a time which you might have heard of called the Renaissance, and as well as many other things, music was completely overturned and reinvented. And the dominant, as well as going from what we call modal harmony to our major minor tonality that we use today, um, harmony, the dominant interval in harmony went from being the perfect fifth, as it was in the Middle Ages, to the major third, as we know today, and, that, and forming the major triad, of course. Now, so, now, although Pythagorean tuning had, um, had fifths that were perfectly in tune, the major thirds were extremely sharp. And so this didn't work very well. Pythagorean tuning didn't work very well for the new system of harmony. And so a new system was devised called mean tone temperament. And the most common type of mean tone temperament had the thirds in one key, perfectly in tune at the expense of the fifths, which would be slightly flat. And there were actually many, many different varieties of mean tone temperament, some which tempered the fifths more than others, some which would temper some fifths more than other fifths, some which would temper the thirds slightly, and all to try and make there be as many intervals as close to in tune as possible. And in fact, it was actually so common for there to be different types of mean tone temperament that sometimes composers, when writing a piece of music, would invent a temperament system to go along with it. That's something we don't see too often today. Um, but mean tone temperament didn't last forever either. Um, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, music started to become more chromatic, and composers wanted to be able to modulate to more remote keys, and to be able to um, and sometimes even music was, began to become atonal. And so a tuning system that preferred one key over another, over any other, could, was no longer practical. As well as a tuning system that did not have even semitones was no longer practical. And that's when equal temperament began to be adopted. And just for comparison, mean tone temperament was used for about 400 years, which is quite a bit less long than Pythagorean tuning, however still, significantly longer than equal temperament has been widely used for. So 
what I want you to get out of this is just that equal temperament, although it's almost universal today, it's not the only tuning system that's been around. It's not the tuning system that's been the most successful in, the, in its time. It's not the tuning system that's been around for the longest time. And it's not the perfect tuning system, as we can see, as every single interval is out of tune. And so, <laughs> and so, although it's pretty good for music today, many people don't even know that it's not out of tune. And I think that that's something that people should know so that depending on the style of music they're playing, they can think more about what kind of tuning they want to use, especially if they're playing an instrument such as a violin where you can actually change the pitch easily and make intervals in tune if you want them to be. Now, this brings me to my conclusion. And to conclude, I want to say, I know this was probably very technical for many of you and probably everyone didn't follow everything, but I hope that I gave you all an idea of some of the problems with musical tuning and some of the ideas. And I hope you all got something out of it. And even if you're not a musician and you can't now apply that directly to your music studies or your music making, I hope that next time you're listening to music, you can, it gives you something to think about. Or at the very least, you can appreciate better the extraordinary complexity and history that goes into something that's as seemingly simple as tuning a piano. Thank you. Class, we have a maximum of five minutes to ask Isabel any questions. Okay. And I actually have a slide with a few different questions, things oh, that I didn't okay. cover in my presentation. So if you're interested in any of these, you might not have occurred to, they might have not have occurred to you, or anything that you had to do with my presentation that you want to ask about. Kiva. Um, I noticed on one of the slides you had a thing that said volt and it was pointing to yeah. a angle. What does that mean? Okay, that is in mean tone temperament. I'm actually gonna demonstrate this for you because this piano does mean tone as well. <laughs> um, the, um, how mean tone works is you take four fifths, which have four perfect fifths, and you also take, which that's gonna be, we're gonna go C. So C, G, D, A. <coughs> no, one more. E, okay? So the difference between a C and an E is a third, and that's two octaves, two octaves and a third. And so you take those two sets of intervals, the four perfect fifths and the two octaves and a third, and between them you get the difference of the syntonic comma, if they're both pure. And how mean tone temperament works is you reduce each of the fifths by one quarter of the syntonic comma, and then so that they're in line with the two octaves and the third, so the third can be perfectly pure, and that's why it's called quarter common mean tone. But because you're diminishing each fifth, then I know we talked about, we already talked about the circle of fifths and how they don't slightly, they don't quite line up at the top, but if you reduce each of the fifths by one quarter of a comma, then it actually goes so that um, the interval you end up at, at the end is lower than the, um, than the just octaves. And um, in that descript, and so one fifth can't be that slightly tempered fifth. It ends up being extremely wide, and that's what you call the wolf. That fifth is very wide, and we can listen for it here. That's a slightly flat fifth, slightly flat, slightly flat, slightly flat. And so that was a problem, and that was one of the problems that arose with Minto temperament. And so they would try and you could put that wherever you wanted it. So they'd try and put it in the, the least used key in their instrument. Um, Cisco, I'm going to use one of your questions from your thing, yes. even though I was going to ask this before. But I, how do harmonics work for brass and woodwind instruments? Um, gosh. <laughs> That's, well, in brass instruments, they actually work using harmonics. And instead of a vibrating string, it's a vibrating column of air 
inside the brass instrument. And that's why within one position or within one length of, um, of tubing, you can right. have a whole bunch of different notes. And those notes correspond to the harmonic series. Okay. However, it's slightly more complicated than that because the tubes in brass instruments, they're not perfectly cylindrical. They have like bells at the end and sometimes they're cone shaped. And so then that alters the harmonics and then things just start getting really weird. So right. um, I don't know that in a lot of detail, but basically um, how brass instruments work is they use harmonics. Right. Um, Julia. Is tuning something that people playing Renaissance and Baroque pieces need to take into account? Like if you're playing a harpsichord with a piece from when mean tuning was used, do you tune your harpsichord to mean tuning to make the, the notes work? And is this something that lots of Baroque musicians know about? Um, I would say absolutely you should do that. And if you're playing a harpsichord and you're playing Baroque music on a harpsichord, you should absolutely have that harpsichord tuned to the tuning system that the composer intended. So in that case, it would be mean tone temperament. However, this information about tuning is so, it's not very widely known and there's a lot of myths about it. And a lot of people don't even know that equal temperament is out of tune. And a lot of people think that equal temperament is the god of all temperaments and is better than everything that's ever existed, which as we've seen is not the case. And so a lot of people, although I think that's what should be done, a lot of people wouldn't do that. Although I'm sure, I, like, so, although some do. So class that really draws us to the end of our time for this development.